You're now listening to Sanity at the Movies, To Kill a Mockingbird edition. That's right. We're talking... Everything's an addition now. Everything's an addition. Yeah. I'm sorry, folks. My gimmick tires of my brain are wide, and they make deep mental ruts that are hard to get out of. So, yeah, everything's an addition. This is the To Kill a Mockingbird edition. And you know what we talk about in the To Kill a Mockingbird edition? Um, The Two Towers. Yeah, The Two Towers. Anything with the word two in it. No, let's talk about To Kill a Mockingbird, a movie that I don't like. It's true. You don't like it. This is my hot take. Oh, I'm Nathan. That's Jake. Hi. I'm not going to say I hated this movie. I guess we're just going to get right into it. Yeah. I'm not going to say I hated this movie because I realize that that's unfair and hyperbolic because the movie's fine. Actually, it's I, a good movie. I can understand why people think it's a classic. Now, on a suge- subjective level, though, I was bored. I did not want to watch it. I was constantly offended by the choices that it made. It had about one thing that I liked, and that was Robert Duvall. And that's because <laughs> Robert Duvall never fails. <laughs> He's an immortal Superman who is great at everything he does. And you <laughs> can say, say what you will about Apocalypse Now and all the weird stuff with Brando at the end. The Robert Duvall section of that movie. Napalm. I love the smell of Napalm in the morning. That guy's awesome. I mean, name a movie where Robert Duvall isn't the, the best. Yeah. There's really not a movie he's in. Your Godfathers, your The I mean, Natural. Even when, he, even when he plays, yeah, a big character, like in The Natural, he plays Max Mercy. It's just, he's great. He's yeah. a really great, colorful part of that movie. Well, he's one of those guys that just breathes authenticity somehow. Like, no matter how many Robert Duvall performances you've seen and no matter how much he kind of does the same thing in a lot of them, you just believe that this guy is there and he believes the things that he's saying. I don't know what it is. There are some actors that are like that. It's not like Jack Nicholson or somebody like that where they have a persona and you just like seeing that persona. It's it's something a little bit more than that. Robert Duvall can just exist and hold your attention by existing like... He's one of the few people I would say he probably could actually do the old cliche of reading the phone book and making it pretty interesting. Mm-hmm. So I love Robert Duvall in this movie. Yeah, just love him anywhere. I love him anywhere. and But it was fun to see a really young version of him with eye shadow or whatever it was he had to make him look kind Something. of haunted. And he does a lot. Ghastly, with, ghostly. He does a lot with his eyes. And it's totally not the Boo Radley that. I think I always imagined a little bit more of like a what's lurch. the guy a lurch or what's the guy in Goonies sloth sloth like I, I mean I know I didn't imagine him as being deformed but I think I did just imagine a big homunculus kind of I think lurch is probably about what I imagine yeah so I don't know context Are the kids gonna get those references almost certainly not but who cares you, I mean we do Look have, it up it is mostly five. To ten year olds that listen to sanity at the movies, yeah. So they should get. Them. So they should get them. Yeah. yeah, we're giving kids an education in all the pop culture arcana of our childhoods, and before that, I Thanks guess to look up guys. Little context: the book came out, I believe. I'm trying to remember what Brandon said in his context, 1960, and the movie came out 62. Okay, so the movie came out pretty quickly on the heels of the book. The book was a massive success, and the movie was adapted. You know, then as now, they would make the prestige pictures, you know, like every, I don't know what's going to happen with coronavirus, but generally we have an Oscar season in the fall where all the kind of adult movies come out after your summer garbage movies have come out. So this was one of those. This was a, not a summer garbage movie, but this was meant to be a prestigious A-list adaptation of a Pulitzer Prize winning novel that the whole country loved. And so it was, it met with an instant acclaim and was a big deal and got Gregory Peck and Oscar got Gregory Peck and Oscar. It's directed by a guy named Robert Mulligan, whose work hasn't really lasted in the popular imagination. At least I I couldn't name another movie that he did that I've seen, let alone that people that don't watch old movies have heard of or seen. This is his, you know, he'll probably be remembered forever for this, but he did a lot of these kinds of movies. These, what do you want to say? These important Fake Frank Capra movies? Yeah, kind of. He did dramas, socially conscious dramas. And it was 
produced by a pretty famous producer named Alan Palooka, who also did socially conscious dramas. He was a director producer. He's most famous for all the president's men. Mm -hmm. So these guys did conscience movies, vaguely liberal, progressive conscience movies, most of which haven't really lasted as they don't. If you look at a lot of Oscar winners, things, you remember Crash? Yep. Like that movie about racism that yep. won an Oscar. I remember Oscar. seeing it. Yeah, it's like everybody saw it and how how much do you actually remember about Crash? I remember that there was a crash and that the cop, I remember things about the cop and the woman. Yeah, and racism is bad or something like that. Yep. But that's not a movie that anybody... Pulled her o them over doing a bad thing and he felt her up and then he had to, she had to trust him to pull her out of the flipped car. It's intense stuff. Intense stuff. Yeah. Like that's the kind of movie that like your mom owns on DVD or something like that or VHS or something. You know, it's like one of those movies that kind of lives in the collections of grandmothers and mothers everywhere, but nobody actually watches or remembers. They just bought it at Walmart for seven bucks after mm. it came out. And that's what a lot of these prestigious kinds of movies were. So that's the history of to kill a mockingbird it was harper lee helped with the screenplay she approved of it she became good friends with gregory peck and with the peck family i think little girl peck was named or no they named a kid you know i don't remember who it was but they named one of their kids atticus i think huh. um or scout or gem i don't remember the crap pecks named their, one of their kids after one of the main characters of to kill a mockingbird uh, gregory peck Obviously a great actor and did really good playing these kinds of upright guys. My favorite Gregory Peck movie is a movie called Cape Fear. Don't confuse it with the violent, sexually depraved Scorsese remake from the 90s. But there's this old movie from the 50s with Gregory Peck playing an upright lawyer who put away a slime ball criminal played by Robert Mitchum. Robert Mitchum comes out and decides to make hell for Gregory Peck's family. And it's just a really suspenseful movie about a master criminal tightening the screws. And he starts out by not really doing anything illegal, but just following him and kind of intimidating him. And then he's, you know, getting to know his daughter and creeping him out. And then eventually, it, of course, escalates. But Gregory Peck always was good at playing those kinds of upright do-gooder put upon Superman, Clark Kent, Clark Kent type characters. And you can see him kind of trying to play against that in this movie. He's wearing glasses. I mean, he's literally Clark Kenning it up a little bit. Yeah, he is very Clark Kent. Takes me out when he uh, does his bad fake Southern accent. Yeah, I don't like but, his accent in this movie. I mean, he's a California boy born and raised. And when he tries to dip into a little bit of a Southern accent, it's just like, oh, man, come on, just be your... Well, he's so in and out with it, too. Like, right. if he just owned it and did the Southern accent, maybe we could, we'd have a chance to get used to it. But it, it's like every 10th sentence or something that'll have he'll, a little bit of a He'll put something twang. with a little bit of a draw in there. Yeah, I don't care for it. So I think that's all the history and context we have to talk about this movie. I've already started to say that I didn't really care for it, but we should let you ch talk, Jake. We'll explore all kinds of things, I'm sure. But what's your hot take on To Kill a Mockingbird? My hot take is that it is, uh, it's, it's great. It's a good movie. I don't mind hardly any of the choices that they made. I think choices had to be made. They made them. I think working with a bunch of child actors is hard and you're going to get what you get. And I think that to make decisions about Atticus and I really just, it, it's not the book. It doesn't represent the, the, the tensions and the grays of the book. But it's a fine little movie. I will say, now, I watched it late on a day that I had to get up a couple hours earlier than I normally do. And I was very tired. And it felt like the movie until you got to the trial. Mm -hmm. Just drug on and on and on and on. So the whole first hour plus, hour, hour and 15 minutes was slow. And I wanted to fall asleep. But I woke back up and and I didn't, there wasn't anything about those early parts that I was complaining against. It was just like, yeah, you know. Well, I'm usually able to distance myself from material enough to understand, okay, they changed the book, but who cares? Like they had to make a movie. And so 
on its own terms, is this a good movie? Or right. Not? I mean, we've we've ju- we just last time talked about Fellowship of the Ring and the whole Jackson. I mean, if you're going to make any kind of apology for those Lord of the Rings movies, you have to be able to say, a, the material was difficult to adapt. B, they had to make choices. C, there's no way to adapt the material. So, can you enjoy Peter Jackson's Lord of the Rings on its own terms? And I think that that's a fine question to ask. And I think it's bad if you start saying, where's Tom Bombadil? On the other hand, I don't know when I felt more like a, where's Tom Bombadil kind of guy. And it's not so much because I needed this or that scene or moment. It's because this movie just doesn't hardly capture anything of what I actually like about the book. Mm -hmm. I mean, I just, I fundamentally, I don't care as much about the trial stuff when I'm reading the book. To me, the book isn't a book that's building up to a trial. And mm-hmm. that's the that's what we're there for. That's the that's the centerpiece. That's the showstopper. The book is about small time t- town life and coming of age. And this movie is so truncated in the way that it portrays that. And so, well, the whole first hour plus is just small town life. And yeah, but it's just very. And it's a whole bunch of Jim and Scout have to learn some lessons, and Atticus has to thread the needle and. Yeah, and I get that. And I'm not sure what else they could have done for that first hour. I found myself wanting like the the gritty HBO version where we could actually spend some time, you know, the eight hour or six hour Netflix adaptation. Like this is a movie I would actually love to see redone in the modern As a series. era. Because it's like the story, if you can't feel time pass, like the passage of time is one of the things that's most profoundly affecting about that novel. And if you can't feel that, if everything has to be compressed into one summer and into the key events without some breathing room. They didn't compress it into one summer. They actually played it over too. Did they? Yeah. Well, it just felt, I guess it's because the kids don't effectively age across the course of the movie. Like the credits start and it's kind of quiet and somber and you have the little box with the Yep. knickknacks and stuff yep i had never i, I should say i've i had never seen this movie before it's a classic i don't know how i missed it but this was my first time seeing it read the novel a couple times i assume you had seen this movie before because yeah. everyone's seen this movie yep besides me but when you have the little box of curios of things that boo gave them and all that stuff and all these kind of icons of childhood i began to get really excited because i was like oh this is cool this is like we're gonna dig into this coming of age story and all these little pieces of what went into making scout and what went into making Mm gem. And then like, you can imagine the credits sequence of the TV show where we see all these little things go flying by the screen as the credits play. And then each one of them is going to have significance. And then you just never really, or I at least never really got that feeling from the movie. It just felt flat. It didn't help that I watched it on Prime and their version oh, sucks. Yeah, I had to deal with a elongated, compressed screen that I couldn't get to display properly on my TV. Yeah, they had a... First com- time that's ever happened to me. They had a compressed screen. I did get it to display properly, but it meant that I was taking an image that was compressed and like fake unstretching Stretching it. it. Yeah. So it was just kind of not the ideal visual way to watch the movie. Yeah. And there's something I don't like about 60s movies anyway. The film stock is worse, is cheaper. The backgrounds look shabbier. The lighting is usually less evocative. They just always feel, something about movies of that era always feel kind of flat to me. Well, there are a lot of things that, I don't know, the use of shadows and hands to evoke drama and tension felt pretty hack for a 1965 film. Yeah. I mean... That's that's some 1940s stuff. Yeah, or like the silent era even. Yeah, or like, even the silent, exactly. It felt pulled straight out of the silent era. Yeah. That's exactly right. And it was just like, come on, guys. You're really going to make somebody stand up and shuffle sideways to get a full shadow? It was just like, there's smarter, better ways to do that sort of thing. There were at that time and well before that. And so that to me, it was almost like, well, we're doing a serious drama here, but I mean, half of me was like, do they think they're camping this up for me? Mm-hmm. Or something. Because it feels camp. Like, yeah. into, to, they have to know that 
right? Like they have to have to know that this is camp. Well, I want to. I liked the movie. I enjoyed it. I thought it was a good movie, but it's also, I guess, one of those movies that. I mean, I will agree with you. It is. It is just fine at what it's trying to do. It doesn't help that I've seen a million courtroom thrillers that came out after that movie. I'm sure that that courtroom scene was dynamite at the time. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I've seen a thousand Southern courtrooms with colorful characters squaring off against each other. And this felt like the least of those. 12 Angry Men was like 10 years before this, though. Yeah. You know, that's that's when I think of that kind of like. 12 Angry Men's the best. And that, that yeah. movie's really actually visually dy- dynamic for happening in one room. The camera kind of starts wide and then it slowly closes in on all the characters as things get more tense. Like that movie's yeah. really sophisticated in what it's doing. It's a good counterpoint to some of the clumsiness of this one. Yeah. So I just looked it up and it uh, that's 58. So seven years beforehand. Mm-hmm. So they've had, they had 12 Angry Men to work with. Yeah. They've had some of these other great courtroom movies. Atticus is great still in that courtroom. Yeah, it's a good scene. And the witnesses, you know, the Tom girl. Robinson's cast well. Tom Robinson's cast well. The girl is good. Uh, the Yule girl is yeah. p- pretty sympathetic and not too, she could have gone wrong in any number of directions, but yeah. they did yeah, a good I job like, with her. Yeah, I like both Yules. Mm-hmm. I thought it was funny that he looked an awful lot to me. Whenever he was drunk, he ended up looking a lot like uh, Hugh Laurie to me for some reason. Huh. I kept imagining Hugh Laurie. Hugh Laurie would make a good, nasty racist. I guess if this movie, if I felt like this movie actually captured the spirit of the Atticus that I found in the book, then that would go a long way. But man, Gregory Peck, for all his fame as playing this character, does not feel like the Atticus of the book to me. Well, yeah, I think... I know they've become synonymous. It an Atticus that I think we needed Atticus to n- to not feel like he could stand down a mob by himself without his kids, right? Which <laughs> Gregory think, Peck, no matter how good of an actor he is, he has such innate dignity and those big, broad shoulders. I mean, he really does look like Clark Kent. Yeah, he well, and he's head and shoulders taller than everybody else in the movie, and he's got like, that rich, deep, voice. resonant voice, yeah. like that square jawline and just everything about him just says yeah man don't mess with this man like the idea that they they had him and bob ewell square off mm-hmm. right <laughs> like why, uh, why would he ever be scared of bob ewell or why would why would we feel any tension about this there is nothing to feel like atticus could have taken bob ewell in a half a second in the in the movie adaptation and what you actually need is for Jim and Scout, it's almost like you want to cast somebody that could look like Barney Fife to Jim and Scout, mm-hmm. but who actually is has the the principles of Andy Taylor. Yeah, I don't know what actor I would cast necessarily. Yeah, I don't either. Yeah. I don't, I'm not trying to... Be like Guy Pierce or something. It'd be somebody who's just kind of regular. Yeah, he needs to feel... You don't cast Chris Evans. Let's see. If you had to cast an Avenger as Atticus Finch, be like Mark, Mark Ruffalo. Ruffalo. Yeah. yeah. Mark Ruffalo's like, he's handsome. He's dignified, whatever. He's fine, but he's also, he can play shrimpy. Yeah. Paul Rudd. Yeah. Paul Rudd actually is how Scout. I mean, like the fact that Atticus, I think they mentioned it in the movie, won't play football for the kids, won't yeah. go to the, the town football game. It's like, you always know Gregory Peck. Yeah, it's like if could Greg, smash yeah, through if, a line. If, if Gregory Peck showed up at the town football game, he would be the star quarterback. Right. He's making some kind of a choice, a stand in not doing it, but it's not because maybe he's got some weaknesses or some He's old. Right. Or when he shoots the dog. In the book, when he shoots the dog, it's such a scout and gem are just like, What? And they have this whole new respect and they never knew when the sheriff's like, Yeah, did you know your dad was awesome? But with Gregory Peck, of course he's awesome. We we know he's awesome. He's obviously awesome. The audience is. The, I mean, the kids still try to act that way, but... Yeah, the kids the kids do a good job. And I liked Scout and Jem, I think, as far as they went. I did, too. They were I pretty... Even, I liked Dill, too. Dill had a it. huge head. Yeah, I thought that was great. Um, yeah. I'm, he was this... He was supposed to be this teeny tiny little dweeb of a kid who was 
acted way bigger than he was. And so they got this frail, tiny toothpick of a kid and he pulled it off. I thought it was, I thought it was great casting for Dill. Yeah, it, it wasn't bad. I mean, I don't know. The kids were fine. They didn't, it was easy for me not to like the kids and not to like the narrator that portrayed Harper Lee just because neither one of them captured the qualities that I actually imagined in the books. But I know that's unfair. Whatever. It's a movie. They did a good job. If my job on this podcast is to say objectively whether it was a good movie, it was fine. If my job is to ex- express subjectively whether I liked it, I really didn't like hardly anything about this movie. I had a hard time. I, I watched it in two sittings, which is fairly unusual. I fell asleep, which is fairly unusual, and had to go back. Like, this movie just didn't do much for me. The murder, the scene at the end with Bob Yule just goes on forever and is really weirdly yeah, done. Well, yeah, the fact that they played out the scene of Bob Yule and the kids for so long and then spent such little time afterwards with... Atticus and Heck and Boo and Scout on the porch. Right. It's like, let's live there for a little minute. That's kind of how I felt about the whole movie. I wanted the movie to be three hours. I wanted to live here. Well, and part and part of it is like, you know, the reason they didn't is because the Atticus of the book was very stupidly convinced that Jim was the one that Yeah. And the Atticus of the movie could not credibly think that Jim did that at least not for long and so they passed over it real quick well that's another thing that's interesting about this is i'm not going to say this is a flaw but it's one of the things that's inherently unadaptable about a book like that so much of what works about it is the ambiguity right and when you make things literal even when you keep them off screen like the yule's death scene it literalizes it like in the book you really don't know how much Boo just grabbed a knife, walked out and stabbed this guy who wasn't even going to actually kill the kids, but was just a drunk idiot or how much it was just a scuffle. Like you don't, you don't know if Bob Yule really didn't fall on his knife. Right. You have no idea. Or fall on Boo's knife rather. Right. They add enough scuffle to, I think, I think the scuffle actually helps make the case that Boo didn't do anything wrong, but it's kind of a more interesting story if you really don't know how much this psychotic weirdo that's been watching these children just went and (laughs) took care of a bad apple in the town and everybody decided to turn a blind eye i mean that is one very bad what am i looking for it's that that's not that's not a implausible inappropriate or bad read of the book in a lot of ways it's just it could just be mob justice and nobody liked bob yule so Let's just let this crazy person solve our problem for us he and turn the, a blind eye. He got eye. the lynching that the Tom got, that he gave to yeah Tom. There's another way it plays where it really was a scuffle. It really was self defense. You bring Boo up, he'll get off anyway. So we might as well. I'm not argu- making this argument morally right now. I'm just saying what the book says. Yeah. We might as well not put Boo through it because we know how it's going to play. How it's going to play, and we know that he didn't do anything wrong actually. So. And Let's all leave. that's going to come of it is a bunch of old ladies are going to start baking him pies and make him a hero and give him attention that he doesn't want. Right. And so let's be merciful. I mean, that ambiguity is nice. It's nice to leave it there. It's nice to not quite know how you feel about it at the end. It's nice for kids to read the book in high school and have to talk it through, talk it through and decide what they think. It's one of the virtues of the book. And the movie just, I guess, gives that to you. But it can't, by necessity of what it is, give you what the book gives you. I don't know. We've only done a half an hour, but I don't think there's a lot more to say about it. I, I mean, I'll just understand. I understand. I, I'll, I'll just say again. I, I understand. The book is the movie is doing what it can, and it's doing it well. I'm not trying to make anybody feel bad who likes this movie. I understand why most people probably do like this. But the one sort of definitive statement I would like to make to everyone is: please do not confuse this with the book. Yeah, you've not read the book if you have watched the movie. This is not it. I mean, the book is not just a courtroom thriller about a great guy that stands up for justice or something like that. It's got a lot going on, and the movie doesn't capture all that much of it. And the movie, this movie doesn't really capture Atticus Finch, I don't think. So, I don't know. Why do you think Harper Lee 
went that direction. I mean, let's just indulge in some idle speculation here since we don't have anything better to do on this podcast. Like she helped with this script. She approved of it. She went the rest of her life friends with the pecs and saying this movie did the trick. But this it does seem fundamentally like two different Atticuses. So what's the deal? Are we just crazy in our read of Atticus? People, by the way, can listen to the Bookening podcast to hear us talk a lot about Atticus, Atticus and all that. Yeah. There's nothing that Atticus does. It's just what they it's just what the movie emphasizes. The Atticus scenes that you're gonna get are Atticus saying, Well, I'll tell you what, you go to school and we'll keep reading and we'll keep it a secret from the teacher. Mm-hmm. You're gonna get him having those sort of tough knowing conversations, helping the kids navigate, you know, the tensions of their lives right. stuff. All of those are in the book. They certainly are. And they're powerful. And yeah, they're great. It's just the little nuances that are lost. For my money, those little nuances are the book, though. If the book has power, if it has pull, if it reaches across the decades, it's those little nuances are where that power lives. Yeah. So to surgically remove those is to take the thing that I care about from the book. Maybe more people than just me have read this book and they have other things they like about it and that maybe that's okay. But those ambiguities are really the interesting thing. I mean, the book is all from Scout's perspective and as we've talked a lot about on the bookening, she's weaving in between Scout's adult perspective and her yep. childhood perspective. She's doing a really good job of not knowing when to hold them and when to fold them, when to just tell you something, when to imply something. And all those little nuances are really evocative, really powerful, and a lot of fun. And to flatten those out is to, to me, it's like we adapted Dracula, but we didn't make it scary or something like that. <laughs> it's like we forgot to do the thing, the one thing that it was supposed to do. Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't know. I I agree with you. I want to make some space to say, was it really that far and that bad of an adaptation? Well, it's weird how you can obey the letter of the law and disobey the spirit of the law. Like you can, you can actually hit, like this does a much better job than say Peter Jackson's Lord of the Rings in hitting the 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 beats. beats. Yeah, Yeah. Like everything that happens in the book happens here and it happens the same way. And the dialogue's all there and they don't really cut out anything crucial to the plot exactly i think you just get the it's almost like you get the perspective in the movie of heck tate or judge taylor right yeah. like there's a reason they put in judge taylor comes to atticus and says i'm giving this to you now that scene was implied right mm-hmm. in the in the in the novel where hey there's a reason why judge taylor is it taylor or thomas or I think it's Judge Taylor, but that might be the Andy Griffith show of it all, diseasing my brain. Yeah. Whichever judge it is. The judge picks Atticus to be the public defender for a reason. Right. And so you get this idea that the sheriff, the judge, they see Atticus Finch as a man who's 10 feet tall. Right. The only man who who would actually have the guts to defend Tom Robinson and actually try to defend him. The only man who would... The guy that you give the rifle to when the dog's coming down the street. The guy that can bear this pressure with strength and ease. And the the guy that you're going to let stand out out in front of the jail. And then you're going to come out when the mob leaves and say, oh, I had you covered from the window. Mm -hmm. Right? So it is almost like you get that maybe more objective perspective of the judge or the or the sheriff of this. And maybe that is what Harper Lee was thinking. Maybe what she wants you wants us to think is, man, kids are dumb when it comes to their parents. How could Scout have ever have thought Atticus was so wimpy and stupid? Right. Like she could have she should have just realized Gregory he, Peck was her dad. Yeah, she should have realized that all along. That's interesting. I mean, that was one of the scenes where I, I was offended was Scout and Jem are talking in bed or something like that, and then the camera pulls out, and suddenly we're on the porch with Atticus. Yeah. And I was like, whoa, that's a major yeah. violation of that, trust with that, the book. And then the judge shows up. Yeah. Yeah, that scene right there. You're going to give us a point of view that's not kids? That's yeah. That's a huge choice. I hope you knew what you were doing, movie. Like That was, to me, the worst choice of the whole movie, too. Yeah. But... 
that's why I went there because I think it is the choice that maybe does signal, hey, here in this movie we're getting a, we're not getting Scout's perspective, we're getting Judge Taylor's perspective, hmm. or or Judge whatever his name is, Thomas or or Heck Tate's perspective or Calpurnia's perspective, even maybe a little bit. Yeah, I mean we're almost getting the we're, black people the, the up black, in the, the black people in the balcony, right? Balcony's yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's where I was going next. You know, they're all going to stay in the courtroom and wait for Atticus to leave, and they're going to stand because right. I mean, the other thing that's important to remember about this movie is this movie is coming out. This this can make some space for it, too, and show me for the grumpy pants that I am. This movie is coming out in the middle of the civil rights movement. Yep. The fact that they're making it into, by my standards, a bit of a cartoon. Well, maybe that's about as much as people could take mm-hmm. at the time. I mean, not to be condescending to our forebears, but... You still have states with miscegenation laws and things like that when this movie comes out. Yeah, there's probably probably some real courage went into accepting the role on Gregory Peck's part, right? Yeah, I think so. Like, there's a world of people out there that are going to hate you forever for being Atticus Finch. Right. Well, then you've got this desire to project the righteous strength of your cause. Mm -hmm. And who better to do that than Gregory Peck, right? Yeah, I mean, he is divine like he he plays righteousness about as well as anybody and what a great actor what a great guy for that role i mean he it's really hard to be righteous and not be boring yeah and he's righteous and sympathetic yeah and you really and and just likable like you want gregory peck to be your dad he's not the freedom fighter in casablanca or one of those characters that's just a total square then you don't like is there anything else to say about this movie? I don't think so. What's your favorite courtroom drama? A Few Good Men. No. Sorry, no. A Few Good Men to me. Here, we're never going to review it, so I'll give my two-second take. Uh, Roger Ebert has a great review where he says, the problem with this movie is that it tells you exactly what it's going to do, and then it does it, and it's so lame. Mm-hmm. And other than that, it's great. And I think that, that that's true. Aaron Sorkin wasn't to completely boring at that point like the dialogue crackles the characters are fun all that stuff's fun but the fact that they're like i think that jack nicholson really wants to tell his story and all we have to do is make him mad enough to do it and then that's exactly what they like the end of act two they say that and then act three that's what happens that's what happens and that's just so lame yeah like if you ever wanted to know how lame aaron sorkin was and see a little prophecy of like every lame straw man bad guy in the west wing or yeah all those shows like no when you say courtroom drama my mind goes to exactly one place right away and i would have to and it's 12 angry men mm-hmm. i don't think there's anything that i can even think of. now you may you may come up with five other movies that are better or more interesting or that i'd rather go watch but i off the top of my head courtroom drama equals 12 angry men 12 angry men is awesome and talk about a likable righteous character and whatever his name is henry fonda. Uh, henry fonda and i mean that movie wears its heart on its sleeves more than this one with yeah. the guy that he's just angry at black people in general because one of them did something or other a jew i actually i think wasn't it i thought it was a young black man but i could be i don't remember putting that back onto it i thought i thought he was a jew it could be it appears to be ambiguous really well, there you go. It's funny that we both brought an assumption to that. His whole conver- there are whole conversations about whether or not he is Jewish or African American. And other conversations where people are arguing about whether or not he's Italian, Turkish, Indian, Jewish, Arabic, or Mexican. It appears to just be very intentionally ambiguous. He is just the other. There you go. See, folks, ambiguity can be good. It can be fun and intriguing. So I looked up the AFI's top 10 yep. courtroom dramas. Number 10, Judgment at Nuremberg. I believe I have seen that, and I believe it is good. Number nine, A Cry in the Dark, Evil Angels. It's a 1988 film. Number eight, In Cold Blood. Great book, Truman Capote. Number seven, Anatomy of a Murder. Jimmy Stewart, wonderful movie. Would much rather watch it again than to Kill a Mockingbird, frankly speaking. Number six, and this is another one that I think of, Witness for the Prosecution. Love Witness for the Prosecution. That might be, I'm gonna, we'll see if you find a legal 
thriller in that list that I like better than that. Witness for the Prosecution, highly recommend. Number five, A Few Good Men. It's fun. Number four, The Verdict. Love The Verdict. Paul Newman plays the washed up, stereotypical drunk guy with his best career behind him. And then he has to step up for one big case and take down the Catholic Church, if I'm not mistaken. Hmm. Pretty great movie. Number three, Kramer vs. Kramer. Never seen it. Looks depressing. Number two, guess. To Kill a Mockingbird? Twelve Angry Men. Twelve Angry Men is number one To Kill a Mockingbird? It is. Oh, brother. There are other ones that I like. What about, we said Anatomy of a Murder, My Cousin Vinny? Can't forget that wonderful courtroom drama. There you go. My wife made me watch Primal Fear with Richard Gere the other day. That was not a very good courtroom movie. It's funny that we haven't mentioned John Grisham or any of his adaptations in this conversation. Hmm. I've read a lot of Grisham novels. I've not watched a lot of Grisham movies. I mean, The Firm is fun, but I don't know that any of them make the top 10. All right. Well, anything else to say about To Kill a Mockingbird, Jake? I don't think so. Yeah, I don't think so. Sorry, this one's short, folks, but don't want to spend a lot of time beating up on something just because it wasn't what I expected it to be. It's a fine movie. If you like it, I'm glad for you. I don't know. I, I admire it, but it's just not the book, and I really like the book. Or not what I wanted from the book, if you want me to be more subjective about that. Okay. Sanity at the Movies. Produced by me. Executive produced by Jake and me. Well, go to patreon.com forward slash sanity at the movies. Support us today. And until next time, step in somebody else's shoes and walk around for a minute.